Skeeds, and I'm the director of media for TAPS. Um, thank you for joining us today for our uh, six-man football preseason meeting. We're going to get started with the presentation in just a few minutes, but I've got a couple of things to address first. So <clears throat> this webinar is being recorded. You're going to receive an email tomorrow with a link to that recording. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please use the questions feature in the GoToWebinar interface. Uh, you'll see a little drop-down menu. We're going to try to answer those as best we can uh, as we go through the presentation. But if we don't get to yours right away, uh, don't worry, there is a Q&A session at the end. Um, if email is easier for you, you can send us any questions to info at taps.biz during the webinar. We're keeping an eye on that inbox and we'll be uh, passing those questions on to our presenters. Uh, but if we don't get to your question today or if it's just too specific to answer appropriately in this venue, please send us an email, info at taps.biz or call us at the office and we'll get you sorted out. Um, third, we've got a handout or two for you today. Um, you'll see those in the drop down menu that says handouts in the GoToWebinar interface. Um, You'll see two PDFs. If you click on those, they'll open up in your browser. You can download them there. Um, if you have any trouble, please let me know using the questions feature and I will help you out. Uh, joining us today from the TAPS office is Brian Bunselmeyer, the TAPS Executive Director, Robert Huckabee, Associate Director and Director of Compliance, Steve Prudhomme, TAPS Associate Director, and Will Dixon, who's in charge of our live broadcasts. He's helping us out uh, with the presentation today. Before I hand it over to Brian, though, I've got a couple of questions for everybody in attendance. It helps us to know who we're talking to and who's here. So the first thing we'd like to know is, what is your school's TAPS football division? About a quarter of you have voted, so I'm going to leave this open for a little longer. All right, I'm going to close this one. We would also like to know uh, what your role is on your campus. Got about a quarter of the total number here so far. I'm going to leave this open a little bit longer. Mostly athletic directors, okay. All right, I'm going to close this down and hand it over to Brian. Good morning. Welcome to TAP Six Man Football 2020. As we continue to prepare for the year, just wanted to get everybody caught up as best we can before we move into the fall seasons. Uh, it's been uh, a struggle since March for all of us. Uh, our staff here at the office has been planning on our return this fall since March the 18th. Uh, those plans have changed a few times over the weeks, but uh, we continue to move forward. The metrics as we review them right now, uh, we still, uh, along with our executive board, are making plans to return in the fall starting September 7th. So thank you for holding on with us. We know that the uh, conferences out there are making their decisions this week through a little chaos into the air. Uh, but along with the Big 12 and, and the other two that are standing, plus 30 other high school organizations across this great state and or, uh, nation, we're going to move forward into the fall. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Robert. He's going to talk about the initial dates that we can look forward to for fall uh, 2020. All right. Thank you, Brian. Good morning to everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, first thing we're going to do is look at some dates that are important. Uh, Will, if you'll jump to that next slide. Remember, if you uh, haven't begun school yet, you're still in summer rules. We publish that information throughout the summer and it's posted on our website. So remember, if you haven't started school yet, you're still under summer rules. Uh, you can have workouts. You're limited to three hours a day, 15 hours a week. And of course, for football, there are those restrictions on equipment that can and cannot be used. And workouts during any summer period are voluntary. Once you begin school, uh, your uh, parameters for practice will remain the same pretty much until September 7th. You can uh, still have three hours per day max, 15 hours max per week uh, for your contact with your athletes at your school. Uh, restrictions still apply for that equipment that can and cannot be used in football. The big difference is this, once you begin school, you can make your workouts mandatory. So once you begin school, you can move from the voluntary world to the mandatory world. And during this time until September 7, no interscholastic competition, uh, practices should be limited to your school, obviously no scrimmages and no games. Important dates to think of as we roll toward uh, September 7th, obviously that's holiday. But if you would like to begin on that day, you're welcome to. And that'd be the first day for our fall season practices for all of our fall activities. So you will begin, uh, for lack of a better description, September 2nd, kind of like we would have begun August 3rd this year. So that's kind of when that kicks off. September 11 will be your first day in full pads. 
The 17th will be the first day. That's a Thursday, I believe. So that Thursday, Friday, Saturday, whenever you choose to do scrimmages, that's your first weekend there for scrimmages. September 24th will be first games. Uh, November 14th will be our district certification. December 10th are our six-man championships. Uh, we've done it this way the last several years. That will continue again this year. December 15th will be our all-state selection meeting. And then December 17th, our academic all-state nominations for football will be due. Our championships uh, this year obviously will be on uh, December 10th, as I mentioned earlier. First game of the, the day, remember we have three great six-man games uh, on that championship day. First game uh, this year will be Division Two. We rotate these each year. The second game will be Division One, and then the third game will be the Division Three. We know you all uh, are always interested in the brackets. Steve, uh, visit with our listeners a little bit about when they can expect brackets and what we can expect in a year like this. That's true. Good morning, everybody. Um, basically, brackets will come out about like they do every year. We get our contracts in. We get our commitments to happening. We do this year. Uh, we're really looking close at a few programs that are may or may not make with what's going on. But around September 15th, we want to release the brackets. But in a year like this year, with COVID and everything else that's going on, we need to expect there to be changes to happening. So you need to make sure that you're, you're monitoring all communication, coming back to the website. And again, there might be adjustments made. We're just at the ready. But hopefully, we'll put this thing out and nothing will change. But in case it does, you be ready and we'll be ready for those changes. And now, John, I think we have a couple more poll questions. I'll hand it over to you. Yes, sir. All right, folks, we would like to know uh, how many years have you been coaching at your present school? All right, folks, I'm going to close this one. We'd also like to know uh, how many years have you been coaching in TAPS? So not just at the school you're at now. Have you ever coached at another TAPS school? How long have you been in the association? All right, folks, I'm going to close this one down and hand it back to Steve, Robert, and Brian. All right, John, thank you very much. Uh, before we jump to rules and governance, just a reminder, if you have questions, use that uh, little menu section on the right there, questions. You can type questions for us. We'll try to get th to those as we can. If we get questions that are relevant to what we're discussing at that time, we'll certainly try to do that. If, uh, if we see some that we know we'll be addressing later, um, just hold, hold on, we'll, we'll get to those. And then if we need to clean up any at the end, we can do that. Before we move beyond brackets, remember, uh, this, is a, this is an unusual year and uh, things might change. So, so be flexible there. Um, like we, uh, we say it this, time, this way all the time, uh, don't print those out when they first come out and never look at them again or never visit them again. Uh, just know that there might be changes um, wild card points uh, certainly uh, will likely come into play. Uh, that already exists for some of those divisions that are um, that are combined there. So so just keep that in mind. Uh, we'll keep you updated as we walk through that. Be patient and flexible with us if you can. Uh, just know that we have a lot of options we're looking at, and we'll communicate those out to you as quickly as we can. We want to take just a, a few minutes to talk about rules and governance. Uh, remind you about the. Uh, the TAPS rules, uh, those are found uh, in sections uh, 158, uh, specifically uh, the TAPS uh, exceptions to the NCAA rules are in 160, and then the six-man rules are in 161 through 163. We want to go through some of those, and I'll pass it off to Brian to just talk about the rules in general. Thanks, Robert. One of the things that, as a reminder, we do follow the NCAA rules. So they're uniform guidelines, and most of our playing rules do uh, are generated from the NCAA 2020 football rules. There are a few changes, and uh, Robert will go over those down the road. Uh, as a reminder, uh, scrimmages and games uh, are contest, and so all of our rules would apply. So that includes Section 138. We know nobody's going to get removed from a contest, but should that occur, that rule still is in play. Uh, you're going to sit the first half of the next game and that's the remainder of the game you're uh, removed in. Another rule that's still out there is the six-quarter rule. So if you do go uh, six-man's a little different. A lot of those games end at halftime, but 
uh, the six quarter rule if you're playing JV and varsity would still come into play. And one of the things that came up earlier as we were searching around and, and as we were going through the season limitations were our five days between games rule. I think that's very important. That's, I think that's very important that uh, we remind folks that uh, we discourage that. We look for one football game a week. It's a, it's a tough sport to play in the first place. And if you play three games in 14 or 15 days, that can really take a, a toll on a young man. We're going to jump to the uh, website real quick, www.taps.biz. Most of you have been there. Will's going to slide on over there. Will's going to hover over the word resources. And uh, underneath that is going to be the bylaws. So if you need the bylaws, as Roger uh, Robert mentioned, go to bylaws. It'll take you. It'll take a while to load. So we're going to stay off of that for just a minute. Another thing that's changed this year is up at the top, you'll see uh, on the left-hand side, it's score standings and brackets. So uh, that's different from last year. So the scores, the the most current scores will be listed there. The standings, once you put your uh, scores in rank one, they'll show up there, and then the brackets. Uh, once we've published them, they'll be there and they'll be updated there as well. As we've asked you, and we'll talk about it in a little bit about score stream, score stream is where those scores in the middle of the page are generated from. So we've got two ways to report your scores. We've got your resources that have your bylaws and your rules and uh, just help us to help you as we go forward. We said it a couple of times, but info, I-N-F-O at taps.biz is our email. Call us here at the office if you've got specific rules and we'll do the very best we can to help you as we go forward. So game limitations, again, what we're really asking for is one game a week as we go forward. Eligible opponents. Um, it's important that you check your schedule and check your opponents because this is going to be uh, the responsibility of, of the TAP school. Um, it's in section 138, school-based programs only, can't play clubs, homeschool programs, affiliated leagues, out of state and national teams will have to be approved through the TAPS office. So again, these are possible, but again, you need to check with the office. Um, what's not allowed, the club team, the independent team, members of non-approved leagues. And there is important, there's important reasons why we do that. We need to play someone who has the same oversight, the same rules, similar rules to what we do uh, moving forward. And so we get those questions in the office. And again, it's better to ask up front than have to cancel something at the last minute. So again, eligible opponents are very important. Um, the official ball of taps continues to be Wilson. Um, it can be a, any leather Wilson ball, any style. Um, you're not allowed or authorized to play with a non-Wilson ball in any competition. That is non-district, district playoffs all the way through. That is the required ball of taps. And that again is, is a little bit, uh, uh, sometimes it's a challenge for you because everybody wants to have their own ball, but having a consistent ball across the, the board is very important and, and it levels the playing field for us a little bit more. And Wilson is a big supporter of taps and we appreciate their partnership. And speaking of Wilson, uh, oh, I'm sorry, before we get to Wilson, we'll go to game information. We're gonna stay on you and, and Will, who's behind the keyboard, will also be in your computer sending you updates of uh, asking for this information. It's very important that you get your schedules in as soon as you know and make them public in rank one. Um, make sure you send these to the officials chapters and then follow up with the scores. Uh, again, in score stream, as Brian mentioned, and in rank one both. Okay, you must do it in both. So again, you'll get a call from Will or an email saying, hey, where's your score? We need to update these standings. We're trying to get the brackets ready for the playoffs throughout the year. So stay ahead of it. And again, if you do score stream during the game, that's a great uh, addition uh, to what we're trying to provide. And now our sponsor role for Wilson, uh, who's been our uh, required ball of taps. And uh, Will, why don't you go ahead and roll it? And next up is the officials. And again, the officials this year, uh, 
the numbers are down if you look at the chapters and, and, and talking to the uh, TASO leadership. So it's very important that we, uh, we work hard to make this a good positive relationship. The communication is very important and understand who can call a game and who cannot call a game. It's TASO and all those uh, TAPS approved chapters, specifically TAPS approved chapters that'll be listed. Again, because they have a patch on their sleeve does not mean that's okay. They need to be TASO trained, TASO membered, and TASO assigned or assigned by the approved chapter. Communicate your schedules immediately and changes, they need to be on that list. The moment a change is made in games, and this year we better be ready for changes and adjustments to be made. Make sure the officials know what's going on. And uh, the availability may be limited, so you might have to do, you know, maybe a Friday game, maybe a Thursday game, but work with them to make sure you have that. Also, site-based officials and I do mean officials, should not be high school or younger students. If they're on the scoreboard, the chain crew, the clock operators, they are the game officials and should act in that way. So make sure that you get that lined up, whether you get them from the chapter or you get them from your school personnel or volunteers, uh, make sure this is in line. And then we'll also talk a little bit about the COVID and all that a little bit later. But again, you're responsible for these folks as the host school. All right, thank you, Steve. Before we wrap up our uh, section here on rules, we're going to go over, remember the NCAA rules. Those are the rules that, that TAPS follows for football, uh, and the TAPS exceptions uh, to the NCAA rules are in section 160 of our bylaws, so you'll follow the NCAA rules for football. Any exceptions that apply to high school football, we have listed there in section 160, and then, of course, your six-man rules are, are there as well. Uh, some uh, things that we have to address every year. We get a lot of questions about this. What about uniforms? Make sure your uniforms are compliant with all the rules and regulations. Uh, we've had a lot in football the last few years uh, wanting to wear gray. Is that home? Is that away? Is that light? Is that dark? Uh, basically, uh, white is white. That's what we say here when it comes to uniform questions. It's not uh, yellow or light yellow or cream or, or um, light gray so keep that in mind as you order uniforms as you replace uniforms if you have questions you can always reach out to us we have a lot of people send us a picture of a uniform and say hey is this is this legal is this compliant uh, that's something that we we have a lot of uh, questions about every year so make sure when it comes to uniform rules and regulations uh, your uniforms are compliant while you're talking about uniforms robert What's the penalty if I choose to not be wearing white? I choose one of those colors that you mentioned. Uh, so the way I remember it, and just help me make sure I'm correct, there is a financial penalty. It's not going to result in a loss or a forfeiture of a game, but there could be financial penalty or penalties and game suspension for coaches. So white means white, be in white, uh, and when you're that, when that's your choice. Uh, and you can flip white and colored if you want to wear that at home as opposed to on the road, but that's a, a pregame decision. So the two schools cannot overturn that rule, still have to stay in that room. Is that right, Robert? I just want to make sure I'm on the right path. That is correct. And if you have any questions, always reach out to us. Uh, there were some changes this year uh, to the NCAA rules. Uh, you can look those up on the NCAA website. Just go to NCAA.org, go to football and look for changes for 2020. I just listed a few here that that are probably highlights. There aren't many. Uh, some of them are, are, are kind of enforcement rules and uh, some have to do with instant replay, which doesn't apply to us as well. But a few that do apply player numbering, the number zero is allowed. Uh, that hadn't been in the past. You can't use double zero. You can't, zero, you can't use zero before a number like 07 or 06, but the number zero is allowed. If that's significant and important to you, that is available now. Targeting, this is a change. Targeting will be administered just like it has been in the past. However, the disqualified player is not required to leave the team area for the remainder of that game. So that's been the rule in the past. They're giving a little grace there. Obviously, if the targeting is upheld, uh, then they will sit out the first half of the next game. Uh, but they are allowed to remain in the team area. Obviously, coaches are always responsible for them, uh, whether they're on the field or in the team area. Other disqualification fouls, and that's what the, that's the term they're going to be using going forward. We've called them ejections. We've called them removals from contest, and that's how it's stated in our rules. But other disqualification fouls, you're ejected for fighting or for too unsportsmanlike or any of those type things, you are still required to leave what they call the playing enclosure, and you cannot be in view of the, the, the game, the team, or, or anything like that. Uh, defensive substitution infraction, 
uh, that that's one that can be alive or a dead ball fowl that could make a difference in certain situations. So that one's important. Uh, we've uh, we've continued this trend of protecting the snapper uh, when they're in a, a a scrimmage kick position. So uh, they've kind of clarified this a little bit. Uh, those defensive linemen that are lined up within one yard of, of of the line of scrimmage, basically on the line of scrimmage, they must be aligned completely outside the frame of the body of that snapper. Obviously, you can't touch them initially, um, but now they're moving you out just a little bit, making sure you're aligned correctly. So you may see that as a point of emphasis as you visit with officials and go into games. And then a change on officials' jurisdiction over the game that used to be 60 minutes before the game. Now that's 90 minutes before kickoff hey robert while we're sitting here talking about targeting that is the only appeal a school can make for disqualification or removal from a contest so if i have a player that is removed from the contest is disqualified or whatever for targeting specifically in the contest and i feel like it wasn't targeting what steps do i need to take to have that reviewed i i, I know i don't go straight to my chapter i know how but how do i get a targeting foul remo uh, reviewed that's a great question. Unfortunately, we get a handful of those every year in six men and 11 men. We do have a process for this. Obviously, at the pro and the college level, they can review those instantly. They have the capability and the technology to do that. We don't at the high school level. So our process for the last several years since targeting was initiated is you can uh, reach out to us. You don't go to the chapter. You don't go through them. You reach out to us here at the TAPS office. Uh, give us a call either over that weekend or first thing Monday morning. Let us know you have a targeting call uh, that you may want to appeal. Uh, we'll have you send uh, those clips to us. And then those clips are forwarded to the Tasso State Football Office. They have a committee of officials that review those, and they determine whether the targeting, targeting uh, penalty is going to be upheld and enforced uh, for the next game or if it's going to be overturned. I will tell you statistically the quality of your film has a, has a very high likelihood of helping or hurting, depending on the situation. But the quality of film is critical for those officials looking at that because that's the only view they're going to have. Um, and uh, they do a great job of looking at those. I would say statistically over the last three years, probably about a third of the targeting calls do get overturned. Uh, so there is a chance, and sometimes, uh, you know, it's a bang-bang call on the field, but those officials looking at it have a lot of experience. They do take time, look through it carefully. They do apply specifically the rules of targeting very carefully. So if you have that, reach out to us, and we can help you with that. We're going to transition now. We've talked enough about rules to eligibility. Uh, rank one is our uh, our database for our eligibility for coaches and students. Steve, walk us through some of the things that we need to get ready for the season in rank one. Well, one thing, and I can humbly say it because I didn't help with it, was the rank rank 101 webinar, uh, which was sent out and is on uh, Tapstop Biz under YouTube that you can go to, and it kind of walks you through uh, rank one and uh, gives you some very good information and a good place to go and review. So again, uh, I applaud the folks in the office to put this together because it's very well done. And, and again, it can answer some of your questions, but we're always here in the office to help with your questions. Uh, moving on, uh, coach and staff. As a football coach, I'm gonna tell you, first of all, make sure you look at bylaw number one, which defines what a coach is. So that coach is almost anybody that has to do with your program. So make sure whether they're volunteered or paid uh, that they are put into rank one and you go through the steps of eligibility that you need to do. Each coach, once they're put into rank one, will be able to open up and create their own account There'll be a coach's profile that needs to be completed with all the important information. We also need to make sure that we have good contact information and for everyone, updated good contact information. They can complete the professional acknowledgement of rules and scope inside their rank one account. So again, make sure you get everybody in for every single job. A lot of athletic directors on this webinar. So if they're the baseball coach and the six-man football coach, we need a mark for both sports, both positions. So make sure that's completely done inside of rank one. Uh, we can't emphasize that enough. Otherwise, we'll turn you over to Kelly and Rhonda and you can deal with them because again, good information makes them happy. Moving on to the students. Um, again, last year we started something new. Before this was all put on the shoulders of the school personnel. Uh, 
every family needs to open up, will be required to open up a rank one account and fill out a student profile. And in that profile, they'll get the acknowledgement of rules. They'll also get uh, the medical information will be required. They can do the medical history online. A physical will need to be done and uploaded into the system. Now you heard that UIL this year is waiving the requirement for the physical. And hopefully you also heard that TAPS has not waived that. We require a physical going into the school year. Now, due to the pandemic and the conditions coming from that, we do extend some grace. If you can't get in to see a doctor, there's some parts of the states, it's more difficult than others. So you can definitely use your most recent uh, physical, upload that as a placeholder in rank one. So again, you have a chance of making the, the uh, student turn green until you get an updated as soon as possible, not as soon as convenient, as soon as possible, we need these physicals. Now, if they had a catastrophic injury or they're coming back from concussion, you would want them cleared, so you wouldn't waive it in that case. So make sure that and all school-based forms uh, are filled out and the students will turn green. Also, if the student has some other forms that are necessary, like they're not living with parent or they're a transfer, they can't move forward until they fill out those forms. This is a great safety measure for, for the registrar, for the uh, athletic director and football coach. They won't accidentally play someone who's not been made eligible yet. They have to go through all the steps to turn them green. So again, this will be very helpful, but you need to get those accounts filled out. Um, transfer students, another uh, service I think that we've done uh, in the office, and again, I wasn't the bigger help, is a Teams course for parents on transfer students. This was emailed out to you. Um, this can be shared uh, with the families and kind of takes them through that and helps you a little bit because, you know, again, you're trying to explain something that was explained to you. And so Brian and these guys have put together this course and, and I think it's very clear and very simple. And again, I can humbly applaud them uh, for, for creating a very good tool. So make sure that you're educating your parents as, as you move forward. Also, we hear a lot about, well, with COVID, are we gonna do this? Okay, I'm gonna tell you with COVID, we have transfer deadlines. Okay, the senior transfer deadline is still in place, uh, which August 15th is the first day of school. Now, again, if you don't have your form done in time, it's about when they're attending the school. That's what that date's about. And then you need to get the form and everything approval done before they start to play in their games. But again, the transfer deadline for seniors is still there. Um, there's also an appeal process uh, that, to, that's attached to all these transfer deadlines. But again, uh, make sure that you get them in, get that documented and uh, move forward from there. Also, a fall transfer deadline still in place, same system together. And uh, the new student eligibility, all your students that were here last year will be rolled over, should have been rolled over in rank one and, and moved up a year. Those ninth graders need to be entered into the system and any transfer students and that eligibility needs to be checked as well. So it's very, very important that you get go to all these eligibility processes early in the year and double check and make sure you use the, the system. The system will, will protect you. The system will let you know what's going on, but only if you input the right information. All right, thank you, Steve. Before we jump to uh, student rosters, which is another very important part of uh, rank one, we had a question about the transfer deadline uh, with uh, people maybe waiting to start school or seeing which schools are doing what. Is there is there any uh, any uh, exception to that? And the answer is no. That September 8th fall transfer deadline is, is, is still a, a solid deadline. That has not changed. The board revisited these issues uh, over the course of, of the past weeks and months, and those deadlines are still in effect. Senior transfer deadline remembers August 15th. Uh, if you start school after the 15th, then they need to be in, in, enrolled in attending on your first day of school. So it's August 15th, um, but if you uh, start school after August 15th, then it's your first day of school, they need to be enrolled in attending, okay? I think the three big terms are they withdrawn from the previous school, they are enrolled in your school, and they are attending your school before they can go out and participate in a contest. So they can come on over before you get that, but they need to be there ahead of those deadlines. So if you have students uh, reaching out to you right now, when is my hard date? When do I have to make a decision? Don't take a chance on th there's gonna be an extension because there is no extension at the present time. So what happens if a student misses the September 8th deadline? Then they might be eligible if they get there before the November 
winter deadline to play winter sports, but there'd be no opportunity to participate in football at that point. So football is what we're here to talk about. So withdrawn, enrolled, and attending are the three key terms as we go forward there. Thank you, Brian. And like Steve mentioned, uh, you can get the paperwork to us after the fact, but those uh, enrolled and attending, withdrawn from the previous school, uh, they're a student at your school. That's very, very important but they don't get to play until it goes green. So get those PAPS, Coach Gunlocks is looking at 30 to 35 transfer students a day. And the majority of them have the STF because the parents filling out the paperwork at home, but we're not getting the PAPF. So the previous athletic participation form, we'll give a shout out for Coach Gunlock. He's for question. You upload those into rank one as soon as possible. All right, last part of rank one student rosters. Uh, you need to create your team for football if you haven't already in rank one. Once you've created that team, you can then go in and build your roster. So you'll pull your students that are playing football over into that roster. And then you'll notice as you pull them over, they're either, they're red or green once you pull them in there because when you pull them into that category, rank one automatically uh, discerns what forms uh, and what information they need to be eligible. So anybody that's read, you can click on them. You can see what forms they're missing. That might be a TAPS form. It might be a local form you require, uh, but until they're green, they're not good to go. If you have questions, reach out to us. Uh, Coach Gunlock, as, as, uh, as Brian mentioned, is our, our main guy here in the office who's processing those. Uh, you'll get communications, transmittals, and emails from him if he has any questions about the forms and you can reach out to him as well. Steve, I think we have a sponsor coming up. Yes, we have Hometown Ticketing is our new online ticketing sponsor. And this year, they probably be very important uh, with a lot of people doing things online, also uh, all the things associated with COVID. Uh, so far, they've been a good partner and they're ready to listen to what you need and try to make to serve your school as best they can. They'll definitely be serving us at the championships this year. Will? Hello everyone, Blake Lance and Caitlin McCann here from Hometown Ticketing. Since January 1st of this year, Hometown Ticketing has successfully partnered with over 2,500 high schools, numerous high school conferences, 20 plus collegiate conferences, and numerous state associations. We are the official digital ticketing partner of TAPS and would love to show you our product and just why TAPS and all of our other partners have decided to join the Hometown family. Hometown Ticketing is continuing to raise the bar with features to help schools make event ticketing convenient for fans, tools to assist with gate and venue management, and touchless scanning for paper and mobile tickets. We are currently working with schools on capacity management. This gives you the ability to allow access to certain groups like parents and students so they can purchase tickets before the events go live. Through the Hometown Ticketing platform, your event staff will never have to touch a fan's phone again to check into events. We offer a no touch scanning option that is quick and easy for your gate workers. Any smartphone or tablet can be turned into a scanner that can give you immediate notifications for duplicate or invalid tickets. Hometown Ticketing offers digital ticketing passes and hard passes for season tickets, all sports passes, or any other type of pass your school offers. Passes are customized with your school's logo and colors. Through our program, these passes are available to your athletic department at no cost. Hometown Ticketing is the only school-specific online ticketing company that was designed to never touch school funds. When a fan purchases a ticket online, the funds are available immediately to your school. No more waiting for checks or payments from your ticketing provider. We offer quick and easy reporting options that can give your event staff real-time amounts for tickets sold and tickets scanned in. We are excited to get to work with TAPS and its member schools. Please feel free to take a screenshot of our contact information and reach out to us for a demo or more information. We look forward to hearing from you and thank you for your time. So as we come back, we're gonna talk a little bit about TAPS channels of communication. So uh, we are gonna do our best to uh, get information out to you. We're gonna use the website www.taps.biz, click on athletics, click on six-man football. While you're there on the right-hand side, the six-man football blog, that will have all the emails that we've been sending to six-man football coaches uh, throughout the year. So go to the six-man football page at www.taps.biz, watch that blog in case you miss anything. 
we will be sending emails to six man football coaches. We mentioned it earlier. If you're the athletic director, please make sure if you're the head football coach as well, you have that listed in rank one. We can only send emails to those emails listed in rank one. So it's very important that that's kept up to date. Over the last year, you saw some push notifications. We're kind of moving away from that based on the information we received from our coaches and athletic directors. So we'll be using emails more. And then follow us. Uh, Taps Twitter is Taps Biz, and then we have at Taps Football. So as you take pictures, as you send out your scores and information, help us populate that as well at Taps Football. So we've got the website, we've got emails, we've got rank one pushes, we've got social media. You can email us at info, info at taps.biz, or you can call us here at the office. Uh, we're open every day. <laughs> we're here to help you. Uh, on Friday night, I guarantee you when the lightning comes and the game delays come, our, our phones and our emails start lighting up. So we're still here to help you through all of this as we get ready to go into the fall of 2020. And again, appreciate you being with us here today as we start to walk through the health and safety protocols. Robert. All right. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> we're going to transition now. Up until now, we've talked about things that would be fairly normal. Uh, for the start of a year for football, things you need to know, things you need to get in order, paperwork and, and those kind of things. We're going to kind of shift now to some of the uh, health and safety protocols necessitated uh, by COVID-19. We shared some things uh, last Friday, some general protocols. We'll get to some of those here in just a minute. But as we transition to uh, this world of, of new things we're going to have to do or additional things we'll have to do that we haven't been used to doing in the past. Uh, we're going to kick that off with a, a sponsor that is related to some things you might need at your school. Steve? Yeah, Reveal Suits pivoted during this time to, to become Reveal Medical, and, uh, and we partnered with them in Rank 1 to offer some of these PPEs and some of these budgetary items that we never had on our budget, and we've never dealt with people in, in, in the, the uh, products that we're needing right now. So this is a very good partner. They're going to have special deals for TAP schools. Uh, the promo code will be TAPS, in case I forget, and Carlton Dixon, the CEO, and if you follow UT Basketball, a former player, uh, is going to speak to you a little bit. Hello, my name is Carlton Dixon. I'm the proud founder and CEO of Reveal Medical Incorporated. Uh, well, we're definitely very excited to be uh, partners with TAPS, prestigious schools, well-known schools, awesome institutions, and uh, we're just proud to be affiliated, proud to be a resource of PPE for their students, their staff, parents even. Uh, we definitely are excited about uh, aligning ourselves with uh, such a great organization as TAPS. Um, very familiar with them. Growing up in the Dallas area, familiar with a lot of the TAPS schools and being a former athlete and coach, uh, just very well aware of its reputation. Uh, that makes it, you know, all the all the more worthwhile to be affiliated. We are uh, excited about uh, our offerings of PPE, uh, including but not limited to disposable face masks, KN95 masks, hand sanitizer, gloves, face shields, uh, you name it. Uh, if it's in the PPE industry, we are able to supply and provide it. Uh, we've been fortunate to provide uh, PPE packages and kit to some of our collegiate partners as well, uh, the Naval Academy and entire Conference USA, which is a partner of ours as well. So we definitely envision providing the same level of service and the same level of product to our TAPS institution. We are able to uh, provide kits customized to how the institutions need particular items. We can package masks and gloves and sanitizer, or we can package gloves, face shields, and thermometers. Very customizable going through us. Uh, we also have the, the ability, and this is kind of a byproduct of what the Reveal brand is about, our ability to customize with officially licensed logos. Uh, we do that in our collegiate and professional athletics world uh, on our suit side, and we're able to do that uh, on our PPE side as well. If that was ever a request or a desire for any institution, uh, we can most certainly provide. Please go visit our website, Reveal Medical Inc. That is revealmedicalinc.com or any of our social media pages at Reveal Medical and of course at Reveal Suits as well, which is uh, also part of the Reveal brand. And uh, we are again, just excited to be a part of the TAPS family and we look forward to working with uh, their awesome institutions. 
Again, we're very thankful to be for our partners and, and Reveal Suits, now Reveal Medical, in working with us. Uh, the promo code is TAPS, T-A-P-P-S. Also, we're working, and hopefully by the end of this week, we'll have a page up, which will be a resource page for vendors of COVID-related products. So you will have a number of companies to look at in case you need to order something and if somebody doesn't have it, maybe another one does. So again, we'll have that up here pretty soon. And again, different sort of vendors that you never had to deal with before we're dealing with this year. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Brian to talk about communication and COVID. Thank you, Steve. As we go forward, the uh, pregame communication is going to be a must. It's the number one thing that we have heard from uh, head of schools. Uh, what are we required to do? What is our opponent required to do as we get ready to move into the contest structure of the fall? So the uh, first thing uh, for all scrimmages and games, uh, you're going to have to have the pregame uh, communication. So that's all scrimmages, all non-district, district, and postseason contest. Uh, the, the teams will uh, move forward through their uh, both varsity and sub varsity contest. So basically the team is going to affirm to their opponent that all participants are symptom free on the morning of the contest. They're going to affirm that are they are in compliance with COVID contact guidelines. And this includes site based officials as well. So if you're the home team, your email, uh, and we do have a sample of that, Robert will get to it in a little bit. We'll basically say to your visitor that our all of our officials, our press box crew, our line to gain crew, all of our player personnel, both on the sideline and in the game, are all have all attested to the fact that they are COVID free and symptom free the morning of the contest. As the visitor team, you'll do the same thing back, saying everybody we're bringing to your campus on the morning of, uh, this is what occurred. Uh, so the home team, again, has a little bit more because you're going to address the press box on the line to gain crew just to make sure everybody's safe and sound. And then the home team will also notify the official, the, the official chapter, the assigner, that, hey, we heard from our opponent and we've checked ourselves and we're all good to go. The reason we're saying on the morning, all of our schools are going to have a protocol for return to play uh, to come back to school. So if a student is in school that day, if they're if you're taking temperature checks or if you're making a parent sign a statement, whatever, you're going to accumulate those. And then before noon of that day, we're going to ask that you uh, communicate back and forth. And we've also asked that same time frame from the officials. Steve mentioned it earlier there. There could be a potential shortage of officials here and there. We just want to make sure that if somebody on the crew does test positive or the crew has to not participate, they know ahead of time. So on the morning of, make sure that you are in contact with your opponent and that you have said, hey, we are good to go and all the folks that we're bringing in our group are good to go. And uh, one of the situations that's going to occur in the past is how many people you let in the team area because you're doing this affirmation, make sure that anyone that's going to be down there. So if your principal is down there, if your whoever your school photographer is going to be there, whoever's going to be down on the sidelines, uh, in contact with game personnel, they need to attest to being symptom free. So Robert, tell us a little bit more about what that actually means. All right, thank you, Brian. Uh, next slide is our pregame affirmation. This the, these are the details and the facts that you're ac actually attesting to each other before you participate in a contest. Uh, both teams, uh, the schools are required, uh, to all staff, coaches, players, trainers, managers, anybody associated with the game, whether they're coaching, playing, or assisting, um, those people, all of them need to self-screen for the COVID-19 symptoms before they participate in a TAPS activity or enter the area where TAPS activities are being conducted. What is that self-screening protocol? What does that look like? Well, at a minimum, you are making a positive affirmation. That's everybody affiliated with the game. You're making a positive affirmation that you do not have COVID, you don't have the symptoms, you're not lab confirmed, nor have you had close contact with any individual who is lab confirmed. So that's what you're uh, attesting to, to each school. You, you are communicating that information back and forth prior to the game. Uh, the home team's responsible to make that communication with the officials. Uh, so that in the end, the home team, the visiting team, the officials, everybody that's participating in that contest, they know everybody who's there has made that same affirmation uh, that I am, I don't have it, I'm not sick, I don't have the symptoms, um, and uh, whatever peace of mind we can give with regard to everybody looking at everybody else and knowing we're all on the same page, that's the purpose of this. In addition, the question has come up in a couple of the previous webinars. What if at five o'clock when we leave, I have a young man who begins showing system. He's, he's my ball boy. 
uh, he rides in the van or on the bus with us. If someone is showing symptoms, this is definitely the year to not fight through. So if they show a fever, if they show uh, several of those symptoms, this is the year you leave them home. This is the year because you've already said everybody you're bringing is okay. And, uh, you know, it's it's the bigger picture here. We don't want to bring it to somebody else. We don't want them bringing it to us. So, again, if that day progresses and you have a, a young man that, or it could be your ball girl, ball boy, it could be a stats person, it could be anybody that's on your sideline. If they develop the symptomology, then this is the good year to move them and, and leave them at home. Uh, and it's a quick, uh, just a shout out, it's a rule that continues to come up. Do I have to be there for half a day? Uh, in order to play a game that night. Well, that's a local control rule. I, however, I will tell you, if you have a young man, again, ball boy or ball girl or whatever, that's staying home for half a day because they don't feel good, chances are they're going to have more than one of those symptoms that Robert was just discussing. And as a result, probably doesn't need, this year in, in, in particular, doesn't need to participate that night. So just kind of a recap of where we've been. And, and as COVID changes just a little bit, Safety is, is more important right now. So it, the discretionary idea of not participating trumps participating. So I'm sorry, gentlemen, go ahead with what we have next. All right, Will, if you'll jump to the website, we're gonna pause right here while we're talking about this pregame affirmation. We're gonna jump to the website. And if you'll see there, taps in the news on the right, those are our most recent blogs and that taps 2020 return to action. Will, if you'll click on that. This is the information that fall 2020 return to action. Go ahead and click on that document, pull it up, Will. This is the information we released last Friday. This is an 18 page document, has a lot of great information about protocols and things. And I'm gonna have Will slowly scroll through this. We're not gonna go through all of it. If you haven't read it already, you need to go grab that, look at it. These are protocols that we have in place as you begin the season, if you're hosting games, if you're participating in games, these are the expectations that are in place. We address practice and travel. Here's the affirmation that I just discussed, the responsibilities of each team. Here's the list of latest symptoms from the CDC. Obviously, we know these things can change all the time. Here's some information about if somebody tests positive, returning to school, return to play. If you pause right there, uh, Will, if you have a student that tests positive, Okay. They are not allowed to return to participation until they've been cleared by a physician. So all that's dressed there. Close contact, that definition, if you've tried to track this or keep up with it, that definition has been a moving target. That is the latest definition we have of close contact. That's important because that's one of the things that you're affirming when you go through this process. Scroll on down, Will. Uh, we talk about some of the protocols, they apply to all situations, scrimmage games, tournaments, non-district, district games, playoffs, uh, postseason, contest hosted by TAPS. We list some things there that you can expect when we get to the point where we're hosting championships. Uh, keep scrolling through that, Will. Uh, cancellation of district games, uh, whether it's related to COVID or not, we give you some guidelines there. You can look at that. Cancellation of postseason or championships, we give you some guidelines there. Then we get to some of the protocols. We're gonna talk about this in a minute. I just uh, highlight it now so it's a resource you can go to. We talk about mask and face coverings. We talk about locker rooms. Uh, we talk about teams and participants, the officials, uh, fans and spectators. This is one you need to look at. We're gonna to get to this one here in a minute. Student support groups and then concession stands. And then these last three pages, are these sample communications that we've created. You don't have to use this one, but if you have nothing, uh, th this is a good start uh, with regard to the actual communication that each team will, will share with each other on the day of a game uh, to affirm that everybody that's coming, that participating, as far as they know, they're good to go. All right, thank you, Will. Let's jump back uh, to the presentation here. And we'll move to some of those specific health and safety protocols that we discussed, some of the changes created by COVID uh, that are specific to football, and then how, how will these impact my program? Uh, we've said this in our webinars already this week. Um, there, there, is, there is not a sport or activity that we envision this entire school year that, that's going to be the way we've done it in the past. And that's gonna be true of football as well. So as we look at that, Steve, talk to us a little bit about practices. Yeah, practices will be done. <clears throat> we expect this to be keeping with local control uh, under the local state and national governance. 
Uh, as we said at the beginning of this, uh, we weren't telling schools exactly what their protocols could be for COVID, but we said there needed to be a uh, protocol for all and a procedure for the COVID as we move forward. So make sure that your school has this, that everyone's on the same page. Uh, this needs to be shared in advance and it needs to be posted. So as you move forward for your practice time, again, it's under your authority um, and the expectation is that you'll handle it very well. But once we intersect with other schools, now TAPS has to become part of that. Robert? Thank you, Steve. We st we'll look at contests now, um, some of the things that apply to contests. And remember, when we're giving you these protocols, these are, these are scrimmages or games that are hosted by a TAPS member school. If you happen to go play a UIL school, and we know many of our uh, schools do, or you play a school from another organization that is an eligible opponent, then at that point, um, if you're the visitor there, then, then you need to communicate with that school and know what their protocols are. But for TAPS member schools, uh, we developed these protocols so that we would have some consistency. As we look at, we'll look at pregame protocols, and then we'll look at protocols related to the playing area, warm-up procedures, pregame, coin toss, introductions, and all those things. Brian, take us through the playing area. We've had questions that have ranged from, it's an outside game, so what do I have to do, which is nothing, to are we gonna sanitize the playing field? Uh, I know that that sounds a little uh, over the top maybe, but there are some schools that are actually, uh, they've been in contact with their turf suppliers and whatever, and they are planning on being able to disinfect once a week or prior to any interscholastic game. We're not requiring that, just indicating that some people are out there and that is their thought. And uh, a lot of times moms have those kind of thoughts. So clean the uh, playing area the best you can based on your school's protocols, your bench and sideline area. Uh, this is probably that good year if you've been working out, make sure the benches are cleaned and ready to rock and roll, uh, cleaned and disinfected, disinfected, just like the press box should be cleaned and disinfected, just like you would your school. So make sure you get with your janitorial staff and make sure those things go through. Uh, as far as the press box is concerned, uh, one of the things that's uh, important in the press box is uh, social distancing. I know if we're in, in six men and some of the stadiums I've been in for TAPS, uh, we're lucky to have a press box. Uh, and some, the press box is not real big and you definitely couldn't separate six feet apart. Uh, but one of the protocols that we're asking is that if you do have a press box and you are going to allow coaches in the press box, that it be equitable. So if you can get two, if you're the home team and you can get two coaches in your side, then the visiting team should get two in theirs. Uh, you don't take up the whole press box and not allow. So again, equity do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, especially in your press box area. And remember again, uh, you're going to have your announcer, you're going to have your clocks, so, you know, you got a minimum of three or four people up there. Social distance as best you can. Uh, we've used the word optics. The optics are when they turn around and see everybody huddled together, uh, it does not look like you're social distancing. So you can do your best, and uh, that's all we expect. For warm-ups, we're going to ask the 40 uh, is, of course, the middle of the field. Step back to the 35s and six-man, uh, and that way you'd have a 10 to 20-yard separation. What we don't want you to do is, during your warm-ups, encroach upon the other team. Uh, Pre-game locker room or field, uh, if you're going to offer, offer the locker room to both your team and your visitor team, if you have one, make sure it's cleaned and sanitized in accordance with your school protocol. If you're not going to offer the locker room, then make sure the teams that are traveling know that neither one of you are going to be able to go in the locker room. You're both going to stay on the field. A lot of our teams choose to stay on the field anyway. The locker room is not something they're used to using, but if they are, uh, make sure we go. Again, in the locker room, uh, most of the locker rooms, even in our 11-man schools, are not as large as some of the public schools. So if you have limited space in the locker room, you're still looking at social distancing. So if it's a small room, you may not be able to send your whole team in there at the same time. So plan about that ahead. If you're the home team, if you do have limited space, please make sure that you let uh, your op opponent know as well. Officials in the pregame, uh, one of the things that uh, I was looking at and was thinking about uh, Tasso, we will put their PowerPoint up. They have actually done a really good PowerPoint is what they expect. Uh, but in the pregame meeting, one coach from each team, uh, social distancing, face masks are encouraged. I will tell you with looking at the uh, age of a lot of our officials and a lot of our coaches, I think the face mask in any pregame meeting would be a good opportunity. Uh, for the coin toss, we're recommending that uh, you do it with the coaches and the official prior to the game. 
Uh, if you're going to do a traditional coin toss, only one player from each team can go out and everybody else needs to stay on the sideline. No lining up, walking to numbers, having your seniors walk out. So that will be a change from what a lot of y'all are used to. Uh, but uh, it, in keeping with this social distancing and the optics thereof, having only one person walk out, uh, we believe and the officials believe will really help. Player introductions as well. Just make sure you have a plan and social distance. Uh, for the prayer, the national anthem, live singing, the aerosol spray is the term they use for singers. They're highly encouraging that you use no uh, live singing. I will also say player introductions, and it also goes to the sidelines. Uh, you know, in six man, you've got a lot of space to spread out. Just encourage your, your young men and your staff and your other folks that are uh, player team personnel to be spread out throughout the player's box, pregame, during the game, and postgame. All right, thank you, Brian. As we move from pregame to the actual contest, first thing we're going to look at is PPE, personal protective equipment, uh, for our contest personnel, uh, face coverings. Uh, we're requiring face coverings for managers. If you have statistic statisticians that are on the sideline, athletic trainers, players who are not in full uniform, ball boys, any non-contest personnel, anybody not not fully suited up in the game or ready to go into the game, they are required to have face mask. Recommended uh, for coaches. Uh, obviously, we know it's a limitation. Uh, we're well familiar that coaches um, communicate and, and holler back and forth and across the field. Uh, it's recommended, uh, not required. For players, uh, we're, we're recommending this before and after the game. Obviously, as you're coming and going, uh, like Brian said, uh, the optics of, of how careful we are and how diligent we are about following these are very, very important to everybody at the contest and obviously for the officials. I think many of the officials may choose to do that. That's up to them, um, but it is something that is recommended. Uh, gloves, that's another portion of PPE. Uh, athletic trainers, obviously they're used to wearing gloves all the time and, and certainly this has highlighted that for the rest of the world. Um, and then we are also saying that managers and those on the sideline who are handling water, Gatorade or equipment that's going to be moved back and forth and, and going to be given to to the players uh, that they should be wearing gloves as well. Um, the uh, document I referred to earlier has a, a, a reference in there to uh, what we all talk about with regard to not sharing water and towels. We're all familiar with that now. But those people who are handling it for the entire team and how, how you manage that, that's up for you to determine. But those people do need to be protected and be protecting other. Gloves are allowed. They're permissible for coaches, for sideline personnel, for players and officials. They're not required, but they are allowed. As we move forward to uh, hydration and towels, et cetera, everything we've read from the CDC, we've read from National Federation of High Schools, the other state high school associations that are trying to do what we're trying to do. Uh, every student should, and coach should have their own hydration, meaning their own water bottle, whether that's disposable or reusable. Uh, I think in this time, I would highly recommend disposable water bottles. Just make sure you pick up the trash when you're done. Uh, but towels as well. I mean, I know when they come off the field, folks are looking to quickly, you know, wipe down and get ready to go back in or your quarterback or your receivers wiping their hands while they're out there. Make sure they have their own towel and they don't share. Uh, hey, it's 14 to 18 year old young men. They're going to do what they're going to do once they <laughs> get out there in the middle. But at least you can encourage uh, uniform allowances to the, the, the things that we continue to get asked. Uh, the NCAA does have a provision for full face visors. If you wish to go that route, make sure your visor meets NCAA requirements and they cannot be colored. They can't be smoked. They need to be clear. Uh, there are single and two piece visors that can be worn that attach to the mask. So again, uh, attachment to the face mask, uh, whether you want to, uh, the mask up there that says mask it means uh, cloth mask. We've been asked, can we attach a cloth mask to the face, uh, face guard? The answer is yes. Uh, however, uh, we did hear of some folks up in the north trying to use plastic ties, zip ties to attach them. That would be a no. Uh, I cannot imagine something that would rip my hand open. Not that my hand's supposed to be on a face mask, but it would be pretty detrimental if it did get caught on a, on a plastic tie. So you meet the NCAA requirements if you're going to attach them. Uh, can you wear a neck gaiter? The answer to that is yes. If the young man wants to wear a neck gaiter and pull it up, he can. Uh, again, if you go back to the studies that have been released recently, net gators may or may not be the most effective uh, means of, of uh, keeping the spread at bay. 
Uh, can they wear a face mask underneath? The answer to that is that's going to be local control is yes. So the NCAA rules are not going to prevent that. TAPS is not going to prevent that. Uh, we're also not going to require that. So all of that would be local control. Yeah, moving on to game balls. We get the official game ball is Wilson. Um, and for all matches with TAPS member schools, we, we expect that to happen. You also have to do something that football coaches do very well. That's to have a plan and execute a plan. There needs to be a plan for these balls with the rotation. The ball boys need to be able to um, be on your side. Uh, we don't do the ball boys on both sides of the field. Keep everybody to, uh, on, on, one, uh, on one side of the field. They need to be sanitized as they come out of, from play. Um, and be able to get into a routine of sanitizing these as the, uh, the game allows. And it can be touched by spectator timeouts, and also the officials might ask for it. But again, uh, we're pretty good about rotating the balls in and out. And this year, we just need to be very aware of that and making sure it gets sanitized. We're also, there are some sanitation products. I know Wilson has offered some. We're also going to put that on a resource page on the website. And so we'll try to offer a few things that people have out there. So hopefully, there'll be some good products for you. Speaking of sanitizing, uh, I'll sound like the first grade teacher, wash your hands, but we need to keep our hands sanitized just because it's a football game doesn't mean that we drop that. Uh, every chance you get, they should have some sort of uh, opportunity to sanitize their hands as they come to the bench, timeouts, quarter breaks, halftime. Again, build that into your plan. The COVID plan needs to be built into the game plan and uh, kind of keep everybody safe as we move forward. Um, Brian's gonna talk a little bit about site-based officials. I'm going to back up just a sec before I go there, so we're going to stay on this slide. One of the things that we need to consider this year, especially the ball boys, uh, keeping them on your side is, is a big positive. That way they're only exposed to folks they've been exposed to in the trip and are normally at your school. Uh, so make sure you walk through that process and, and have enough balls. I think that was, Robert, when we were with the Tasso football officials, uh, don't just have one or two. Have more than enough so that the game doesn't slow down and, and we go there. Uh, Site-based officials, we're going to hit it again. It's your official clock. It's your play clock. Social distance as much as possible when they're up in the press box. Your line to gain crew, your chain crew, they need to self-screen as well. Uh, for varsity games, make sure that they are not in high school or younger age kids. Make sure that's adults over there on the line to gain crew. And you should require them to wear your face mask. So, again, if it's a line to gain crew, unless they have a documented reason to not wear a face mask, it would be really good for them to go ahead and have that face mask and be ready to go. Uh, well, a question came up, can we still use our inflatables as part of our pregame or halftime runouts? The answer is yes. Uh, that would be based on local control. So if you are using the inflatable and you're going to use it pregame or whatever, uh, again, consider that word optics. If we run 20 kids and coaches into the inflatable bubble and then they all run out hand in hand, just make sure you have a plan there. So yes, you can still use them. TAPS will not limit those postgame. Uh, it's it's going to be different this year. Uh, and, and six men especially, uh, player personnel shall not cross the numbers on their sideline. So basically players do not need to go out on the field after the game. Uh, players that are not in full uniform should wear face masks. Those that are in full uniform, meaning their helmet is on, et cetera, uh, would be okay to not have a face mask and practice your social distancing. Uh, we're asking that no post-game physical interaction between the teams, which means no handshake line, shake line, slapping hands, et cetera, between the two teams. We're asking that not to apply. Uh, got a call yesterday, well, we can bump elbows. Well, what we're saying is no post-game physical interaction between the teams. So the bumping elbows, slapping hands, all those things have the same benefit of, of touching each other. So we're not going to do that. Uh, and make sure that you uh, observe your social distancing when you're coming and going from the sideline and when you're leaving the playing area or the playing enclosure, I guess, as the NCAA said. So I think it's important. I know it's going to be a change. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of our schools uh, have enjoyed in the past the post-game prayer, uh, circle up and have both coaches talk. Again, uh, the optics of that and, and the fact that you're now putting all the players together in a close proximity, no post-game prayer at this point un unless the uh, opportunity presents that TAPS can release this later on. Right now, we're, we're clamping down pretty tight. Uh, we'll look at uh, uh, changes as the year goes on from what you're seeing and what we're seeing statistically. And like we say, we're trying to help manage risk where we can. We do know there is a little risk. We all have differing opinions of how much risk, but if you can mitigate or manage every opportunity you can, we're going to do it. And that goes with uh, travel. That's up to local control. TAPS is not going to tell you uh, what you should do on the buses or vans or whether you're carpooling. Uh, we, we, 
you know, ask you to use good judgment, face masks while you're on there. But again, local control and make sure that you have those outlined for your various teams at your school and that everybody knows what the plan is and that they execute that plan. When it comes to fans, um, Robert already kind of showed you where on the website that we have some of our guidelines for fans. Um, make sure that you go in there and you download that document um, and be able to reference it and know that the other team, the other people in your district have that same document. Um, in the stands, it's important that we keep the, the social distance as well as possible. Uh, know your, think about every one of the facilities that you're at, go over a plan where people can go. You need to go ahead and make sure that is communicated very clearly to the people that are gonna be attending the game. Um, the fence, everybody has that fence and everybody gets on that fence and they wanna get closer and closer and they wanna talk. Again, we need to keep that distance where it needs to be. And again, there needs to be some form of affirmation of no symptoms when, when someone is entering the facility. You can do that through the redeeming of the ticket. You can have someone out there. Again, hometown ticketing is also a good uh, partner for that uh, to be able to, to maintain that. But again, we need that affirmation of the fans just like we do the participants in the game. And the fans do not need to be on the field area. Um, if you have something you do before the game, we ask that you stay out of the field area. We're trying to keep our little bubbles inside of bubbles at, in, in the stadium and having fans spill out into different areas. So we need that discipline there. And again, the communication. And again, this is personal accountability. And this is how we're gonna build this is through personal accountability for all stakeholders involved in this. And especially on game night when we send to kind of let down our guard. Okay, moving on to these sidelines. Sidelines needs to be clear. As an athletic director, uh, I, was, I got to where I was doing that when we were at Nolan and everybody wanted to come down. And again, we, we marked it off, we, we, we had badges, we did different things, six man football, same way. You're gonna need to have somebody down there to be watching that sideline, making sure the social distancing is happening. So again, the sideline is gonna be a very challenging place for you. But if you can get those agreements made in advance, they will help. And also, again, inside these uh, district executive committee meetings, it's key that we talk about things and we, and we have an agreement and we have an understanding moving forward. And especially as we go to the next thing, the auxiliary groups. And again, with six man, you have differing groups. You maybe you don't have a 60 piece band marching out there, but we do have drum lines and cheerleaders and dance teams and spirit groups. Make sure we know where they're gonna, if they're gonna be allowed, where they're gonna be allowed and all of that. You do not want to have a confrontation at a gate with someone trying to come into the stadium and go, oh no, we're not going to have you guys here today. We said no bands. Well, that needs to be done in advance. So make sure that you know what the protocol is going to be, where they're going to be placed uh, in advance. And again, the district will go a long way to doing that inside your district, but also that uh, in the week leading up to the game, there needs to be that communication and understanding. Um, moving on, I'll hand it over to Brian for the playoffs. As you think about some of the folks that have uh, referenced the UIL bands and availability there, or cheerleaders or dance team, et cetera, we're not saying you can't do that. We're encouraging all stakeholders. It's a great word. They're as big a stakeholder as, as out there. Uh, it, if you can find a way locally to let them perform or to, to socially distance, we highly encourage that. I will say this is one of the years in my life that I'm glad I'm not a local administrator having to figure out how I'm going to do homecoming. Uh, what that court's going to look like and the presentation and how you're going to do it. Uh, but social distancing is going to be important in that. So I don't know who coordinates that at your school. Hopefully it's not the athletic director uh, and you can have someone else help you. Uh, playoffs, that first round right now will still be at the higher seed. So the higher seed will be the home team. And again, your requirements, uh, your protocols as the home team would go into play. Uh, when you get to the neutral site, that second round of the playoffs, uh, that's when both schools' protocols come into play, and you need to really have that discussion at the athletic director level. Uh, they're a little more restrictive. I think we can do it, or no, they're not that restrictive. Uh, maybe we can go ahead and acquiesce. You cannot force your opponent. Your protocols have to do with your school. Their protocols have to do with their school, and away we'll go. Uh, playoff concerns on neutral sites as well. Remember that there is a host facility, so if you're leasing or renting that facility, uh, they may have uh, controls protocols that are more restrictive than yours, and you need to bow to those. Uh, they will tell you how many folks can come, the allowable numbers. Uh, they may also limit bench and sideline spacing, auxiliary groups, and where they can go. Uh, and again, I think one of the things you're going to negotiate hard this year is locker room availability. I mean. 
you know, how hard do you have to clean it? Do you allow showers? Those kind of things. So I think it's there. And any local personnel, if you're using local personnel for the clock, if you're using local personnel for the chains, or if you're using them to uh, take tickets, et cetera, they need to do that self-screen uh, self -screen affirmation as well. So a little bit more to go on when you're going to a neutral site than just show up and play this year. Uh, make sure your protocols are out there so everybody's on the same page. The last thing you want to do is come into a situation where your protocols are vastly different than your opponent. Nobody knows ahead of time. Just communicate, communicate, communicate. Robert? All right. Thank you, Brian. Before we move to championships, we'll grab a couple of questions. Here's a great question. Can I get a copy of this? Uh, this will be available. Okay. Uh, John will give you information at the end about how you can uh, view it. Uh, we also are working on a specific page on our website. The ladies are working on it as we speak, where we're posting uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint information that we're sharing here, and that'll be available uh, if not later today, no later than tomorrow, uh, but that will be available. Uh, here's a good one about timeouts. Will there be extra time considered for timeouts or water breaks during games with regards to COVID? Other associations are, are really working hard with the officials, so I would encourage in your pregame meeting with the officials uh, to make sure that you go over that. I am hoping uh, after our discussions with Tasso football that there will be a little uh, on the change of possession there will be a little bit longer lag there because you are using individual water bottles and individual things that they'll be there and i think they're encouraged by that so reach out to your individual assigners uh, and then reach out to your crew chief when they get there and ask that specific question i think if both coaches are in agreement uh, it won't be as a big deal i think you can lag a little bit on the timeouts and lag a little bit as long as you're making every effort to get them hydrated i think that's it now if you're not making that effort to get them hydrated they may clamp down a little harder than they would have before no, that's a great point. And there has been a lot of discussion about that. I think everybody understands when we're not sharing towels and water bottles like we have traditionally in the past, there may be a little more time involved there. So do speak with your officials and make sure that uh, that you have that lined out before the game begins. And if there's anything uh, that we hear coming down the pipe, we'll certainly share that with you guys as well. Moving on to the championships, what can be your expectations? Uh, if you uh, have a great season, have some success, and we see you at our championships in December. Um, players not in uniform, uh, not in full uniform, obviously. They'll be under whatever restrictions we have at that time. If they're the same as we shared today, or if they're different, we'll let you know. Uh, coach, coaches will still be encouraged to wear a mask if that's still where we are in December. Um, the team areas may be expanded if necessary to allow for social distancing. Uh, that's probably not an issue for most of our six-man schools. For our larger 11-man schools, that may be an issue. We'll be getting information out to you as we end the season and then move into the playoffs about things that will be available or expectations, certainly for the championship. Locker rooms, if available, uh, will be provided for team personnel meetings. It may or may not be. That'll depend on the circumstances that exist at that time and a particular host facility that we're using. Certainly bathrooms will be available. Uh, showers, probably not allowed, but we'll see. Uh, as we get to that point, but just just plan and prepare. We know a lot of six man teams load up and drive across town and and don't use a locker room, play and go home. Uh, that's not true in every instance, and certainly travel dictates that. We'll get back to you on that kind of information. Uh, Sidelines taps will not be providing any coolers or anything like that. The facility will have the availability as as has been in the past for you to fill up your coolers, bring your own stuff, and then you'll be responsible for that. Uh, another thing to expect with regard to the championships, live streaming. Uh, we'll continue to live stream all of our contests and championships as we have the last several years. Uh, that'll probably be more relevant this year than it has been in the past. We expect that some may not be able to or may choose not to attend the games in person. Uh, there may be limited attendance. That That is a possibility depending on the, the, the particular local ordinances and, and host facility. Uh, we plan on allowing a little bit longer time between the contest. Uh, I know it is a, kind of a quick turnaround in the past, having three six-man games on that championship day, getting those locker rooms flipped, getting them ready for that next game. We'll probably schedule that a little um, extended this year to allow a little more time, but we'll get more information to you on that. We're just uh, sharing some things with you that we're thinking about now that's going to change our dynamic of, of hosting these facilities. Uh, we will need the ability to sanitize between the contests of the locker rooms, the play-in area, the fan areas, 
and then pre and post game, we'll have specific information for you with regarding player introductions and then post game awards. Steve, I think we have another sponsor here. Yes, we do, and right on time. It's Blue Frame Technologies. They are the platform used by Taps TV, and, and again, we want to encourage everybody, if it's something that you're looking at, consider Blue Frame and consider joining the Taps TV network. Um, the quality and the consistency of Blue Frame has just been unbelievable since we've moved to it, and, and hopefully the quality of ours have, has, uh, of our broadcasts have gotten there. But also in a year like this, like no other year, I think it's important. And Blue Frame has some great deals available for TAP schools. So Mark Krug and Blue Frame Technologies. Mark Krug, I'm the Director of Partnerships uh, at Blue Frame Technology. I think Blue Frame is special because it provides an end-to-end -end solution for video streaming, starting with our production truck software and all the way through our streaming platform and the way that we can deliver uh, our clients' content uh, to the modern platforms that people are using through web, mobile and smart TV uh, devices. Well, the, the Blue Frame and uh, TAPS uh, partnership is, is really special to us because we provide the, the whole streaming platform for TAPS TV, which is the official digital network of the TAPS organization. So not only is that the place where all of the uh, state championships get profiled, but it's a great uh, avenue for any member school of TAPS to be able to have a, a very prominent presence for, for their uh, athletic and event broadcasts. We understand the, the, the high school space. We have valued our software and our streaming solution at a price point that really fits into the TAPS budget. So at just $1,000, you can stream all of your events for the entire academic year, uh, not only to your website, uh, but to the TAPS TV network. We greatly value our, our partnership with TAPS. We're looking forward to another great year and continuing to build on, on the TAPS TV momentum and success. Uh, and we invite any school that's looking for a change in their video streaming uh, service uh, to obviously give us a first look and, and become part of the TAPS TV platform. Okay, and we, we thank uh, Mark and, and our, uh, our good partners at Blue Frame. And now Brian's going to do what most first grade teachers do all day, every day. He's going to answer the question of what if. What if? What if? What if? What if? Well, you know, this the that might be the uh, the tagline that we use for the entire year. What if? That might that might be this year entirely. So, uh, as Robert was talking about the championships, and we were talking about neutral sites, uh, you know, our partners are wanting to dance with us and have us back. We're looking forward to being back in Central Texas for our championships. However, they haven't really started school back yet, and, and most of the schools are not, and whether they're going to be allowed by their local protocols to host us or not is a big question right now. Uh, and one of the things that we're seeing nationally is the same way, is where can we go and what can we do? So plan on the Central Texas location for the state championship. I'm not gonna commit to where uh, at the present time. And uh, even when may be a little iffy when we get there, if they can only do it at a certain time, then we would definitely try to comply with that as well. So what if a team cannot play a contest or district contest? It just goes away. It's not a forfeit. It's just a, that's a zero, zero, it doesn't count game. So if either you or your non-district opponent are not able to play, it goes as a no contest. It's not a forfeit. Uh, what if a team cannot play a contest during the district season? Same thing, it goes away. It is not a forfeit or a forfeit win, and it does not necessarily take a school out of the playoffs, depending on why they forfeit it, especially if it's COVID. So if it's COVID or health related, uh, that's still not a forfeit, it's just a no contest. Uh, what if we get into the playoffs? This has happened a couple of times in the past on other things. What if we get into the playoffs and uh, a team that advances, they win on Friday or Saturday, then sometime during the next week, uh, COVID or some other situation, the flu by that point steps up and takes them out. Then we would look back to the previous game and look to advance the, uh, the, the loser of that previous game. So we do have a plan in place for that. Uh, we're hoping we don't have to use it, but we do have plans in place. And then what if a team cannot play in the championship? Uh, the situation there is going to be, uh, I really don't have the answer to that one because there are so many variables. Uh, is it one team? Is it both team? Is it weather? Is it is it COVID? Is it whatever? And, you know, we did move the uh, championships in football one year to uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of the next week. So those opportunities, if we can make a slight adjustment over a major adjustment and dropping a team, we'll do everything to keep both teams in the state championship. Uh, again, I thank you all for joining us here today. I thank you for your enthusiasm for six-man football. I thank you for being part of the TAPS extended family. 
Uh, we will have all of the webinars from this week and next week up on the TAPS website. Those, that information will be linked off the homepage. Uh, it'll also be linked off the individual pages. So www.taps.biz, 254-947-9268. 254-947-9268 and info, I-N-F-O at taps.biz. Email us if we can be of assistance. Again, know that we're going to get this up as soon as possible for you to use as a reference. If other questions arise as you go through the days and the weeks, please let us know. Um, I will say that for uh, this year, um, asking uh, forgiveness after the fact is not as good as asking for permission up front. So if you have a question, if you have a concern, and you think you might know the answer, but you're not 100% sure, please reach out to us. Info, INFO at taps.biz, 254-947-9268. Let's all get through, through this together. Uh, we don't know what the future holds, but we know that as you're giving it your best shot, we're going to give our best shot as well for all of our stakeholders. Thank you again for joining us on today's webinar. And John, I'll let you give the closing comments. Thank you, Brian, and thank you all for being with us today. Um, folks, once again, if you've got any questions or if we didn't get to yours today, please send us an email or call us at the office. I've got two handouts for you. Uh, there is a continuing education uh, certificate for two hours. Uh, for those of you who want to document that with your campus, that's available for you. We've also got a flyer from Blue Frame about their uh, pricing structures for TAPS schools. So if you click on the handouts drop down in the GoToWebinar interface, you're going to see those two PDFs listed click on either one of those it's going to open in a new window in your browser and you can download it from there uh, there will be links to these handouts um, sent to you in your follow-up email that you will get tomorrow along with a link to the recording of this webinar uh, it takes us a little bit longer to get all of these uh, recordings processed and, and uploaded and ready to go because we have so many this week so thank you for your patience you'll be getting that follow-up email tomorrow um, I'm going to leave the webinar open just so people have a chance to download those handouts if they need to, but otherwise you folks uh, enjoy the rest of your day.